So you started out as a fashion journalist and you've ended up writing this tomb, Resize and R Rise and Resist. There must be a story in between. It's kind of an odd trajectory, right? I think that many people might look at me and think, what? What is this woman who's a fashion journalist whose job it has been for two decades to tell you what shoes are in style or what hem length is going to make sure that you look absolutely on point each season, is suddenly delving into this world. <laughs> It comes from fashion. I think I started to write this book about passionate change makers who make change in their own communities from where they are, starting where they are. So not just those charismatic, legendary leaders that we know have led movements through the lens of history, but just ordinary people doing work in their own worlds to try to shape a more sustainable or a more fair community. And in my own life, it came from fashion. That's what I come from. And there was a catalyst, and it was Rana Plaza. And I'm sure that many audience members are very familiar with that industrial accident that happened outside of Dhaka and Savar in Bangladesh in April of 2013. But for those who may not be, just recap right. it briefly. So this was an accident that happened in a garment, a garment factory complex. There were several factories in these buildings. The buildings had, had started to crack before this happened, so they were unsafe. And the factory owners knew that they were unsafe, but ordered workers to come back into these buildings because there were garment orders that needed to be fulfilled. When the, the buildings collapsed, 1,138 people were killed. I mean, the numbers are just astronomical. There have been industrial accidents through history in garment factories, and many of them in Bangladesh. There have been fires with terrible loss of life, but the magnitude of this number shook so many of us so many of all of us, but particularly I think those of us who work in the industry, I started to think, am I culpable? Am I in some way part of this system that is broken? And the answer is yes. So don't S jump over that, that thinking though. So you're a fashion journalist, this happens. Mm. Were you thinking along those lines or did you hear that news and think, I need to take a, a good hard look in the mirror? We all do. The latter. And I think it was a common, commonly felt reaction. Yeah. I didn't know what to do about it but I'm a journalist, so I have a platform from which to tell stories. Recently I was on the news and someone said to me, how can you be a journalist and an activist? Surely if you're a reporter, you have to be impartial. And I thought about it and said, well, I'm not a reporter. I'm a fashion editor and a storyteller. And yes, if you're reporting on the news, you've got to be impartial, but I don't feel impartial about this. So how did you go about changing what you do? So I didn't know what to do initially, um, I spoke with other people in the industry and asked them what they thought they could do. And then I found out about a campaign that was begun in London called Fashion Revolution by two fashion insiders, not professional campaigners, and people with no experience in campaign building. Their names are Ursula de Castro um, and Carrie Summers, and both designers. And they were horrified by what they saw on the news unfolding around Rana Plaza. I mean, in some cases, there were people who had their arms cut off in order to free them. There were people looking for their mothers. Garment workers are overwhelmingly women, and they're overwhelmingly women with young children. About 60 million garment workers worldwide. Um, I don't know what the percentage, like more than 80% are women. So. This was like a feminist issue. It was looking at our fellow sisters around the world going through this terrible thing. What do we do? These two women, Ursula and Carrie, started a campaign called Fashion Revolution. And their idea was that they would mobilize consumers, ordinary people who wore clothes, which is everyone, right? To ask a seemingly simple question, who made my clothes? And how did that gather currency? Well, it was fascinating because who made my clothes seems like such a simple question. Mm. It turns out that no one really knew. We've lost that connection once so deep with how our clothes are made. Yeah. And now that they're made on the other side of the world, mostly, it's quite difficult to understand who made them, how, and under what conditions. The idea, and we'll talk about this, um, I explore this in the book, what makes a campaign successful? Yeah. How do you make a movement work? And even though Ursula and Carrie and their team, there's lots of them who volunteer, and I also volunteer from Australia, um, even though they had no background in campaign theory, they understood that you have to have a goal and a vision. And their vision and goal was make the fashion industry more transparent. And so many of us would have teenage girls in our household, and they always ask, where was it made? Was it slave labour? Those questions. Did that happen 
overnight or no. has it been a slow burn? I love that you said that, Madonna, because I don't think that, that young people or any people were asking those questions widely until Rana Plaza. Um, I think that's down to the work of campaigns like Fashion Revolution, yes. which is now in its fifth year. It's in 100 countries. It's a charity. Um, it's incredible, and it has mobilised this kind of community action. And that's just one of the stories I tell in the book. But so uh, that's one of the stories. So I want to widen yeah. it now because the book is very well researched and it goes beyond any one campaign and any one person. And at one point you say in it, we're going through this period of rising outrage and discontent uh, in a way we've never seen for 50 or 60 years. Is that predominantly America or do you see the same thing in our home country? I see it everywhere. So that that um, idea that we're seeing more a rising period of outrage not seen since the 60s comes from researchers at Columbia. But it's not just America. I think at the start of the book, I mentioned the number and it's more than 800 yeah. actions, sit-ins, rallies, and protests that happened in the US in 2017. So certainly right now in the States, there's there's a wave of protest culture that's exploding in the context of Trump. But it's not there, it's not just there, it's here, it's everywhere. So when you say exploding in the face of Trump, that's one of the, the causes perhaps in America. What more broadly are the causes? Why are we so angry? In the, in the American case, and I started writing this book after the women's marches happened, everywhere, not just in the States. Fi about five million people took to the streets on January the 21st, 2017. Trump was like the spark that lit the fuse, I think is the phrase I use, but he's not the whole reason. I think that this was about interconnecting issues and the idea that I'm exploring this in, in the work that I'm doing at the moment, that issues that used to be previously quite siloed, you cared about the environment or you stood over here and you cared about women's rights, or you cared about refugees. I think that now those silos are breaking down and that there is an increasing understanding that if you care about justice, climate, social, feminist justice, you care about all these interlinked issues. And, yes. and they're, the, they're the reason why we're having this kind of momentum behind speaking out and, and protest. And maybe social media has helped um, contact like-minded communities. But let's come to that in just a moment. Uh, Gloria Steinem says, uh, the future depends entirely what each of us does every day. Uh, after all, a movement, a moment is only people moving. So you, you've raised the idea that an activist doesn't have to be someone really well known. Yes. What makes a good activist? So I'm really interested in the grassroots activism and in ordinary people. I'm an ordinary person. I'm not an academic or a campaign theorist or a politician. I'm just an ordinary person. Why I got involved in activism, and I'm going to call it fashion activism, and why not? Because I think you can be an activist wherever you are. Was It came from the personal. So I think that what makes a good activist is passion. I'm stating the obvious, but it's so important. You have to have a fire in your gut that will sustain your momentum to get behind a cause to try to make change. I think that tends to, from the stories that I've researched in this book, come from the personal and come from local. If it affects your community, it's more likely to drive you to try and take action right there and then. But then we need to have vision and we need to have leadership. Yes, okay, so let's come to those. You, you said, uh, and I think the figure's 834 different rallies, marches, uh, moments in one month in America last year. and uh, uh, But what makes one successful and one fail? What, what gathers like the fashion one? I think it depends how you define success. And numbers is one way. So the Women's March movement has been, I would argue, very successful. Critics say that there was no direct policy ask and therefore it's hard to quantify that as success. But I would say, no, actually, that is about solidarity and the sheer numbers prove that that was a continuing moment. If you want to draw the long bow, that to me is a movement. And that's, that's I mean, in 2017, the Webster Dictionary um, named feminist or feminism as its word of the year. Yeah. It's a resurgence in these ideas of feminism and solidarity. So to me, that was success. But I think that we can also define success on a much smaller scale. And that can be around making, hitting your goals and making change. Change. Um, I could tell you a cute story that yeah. I love <laughs> that's very grassroots and very small, but so, to me, motivating and delightful. I tell the story in the book of 
uh, a young woman in Sydney called Harriet Spark. She's, uh, she works at Taronga Zoo. She's passionate about the ocean, but she's an amateur diver um, and snorkeling fan. She went snorkeling in Manly Cove where she lives with a friend and they found um, what the friend thought was, obviously knew it wasn't, but what the friend saw and went, is that blue grass growing out of the sand? And then yanked it up and it was a plastic straw. And she said to Harriet, this is a plastic straw, what? And then they went down diving to collect some more. How many could they find? And they found 450 plastic straws embedded in the sand in their little backyard in the ocean, so Manly Cove, just around where they work. They then decided to take action. So instead of whinging or just clicking on a Facebook group, they set up a Facebook group and they invited everyone who cared to come down and straw call on a Saturday morning in Manly Cove. It's a great name. It was fun. It was summer. They did it every Saturday morning for seven weeks or something. And all these people they'd never met turned up to straw call. Kids, older people, all different people, but locals. And then they all straw called. But then they had a plan. So it wasn't just let's complain, let's find some bad evidence. Their plan was to go to the local cafes, bars, um, and people who use straws and say, this is evidence of the problem, but also here's paper straw vendors, here are solutions. Will you get together with us to change this? And they did it. So it was an idea plus strategy that made plus it work. Plus strategy, plus a, a clear achievable goal. I mean, good to start small because it's hard to beat climate change in a weekend, hey? You, you, sure. <laughs> um, you said they invited everyone down. Just and on Facebook. Yeah, and yeah. You say in your book also that you raise the issue of depression, anxiety and loneliness. Ah, yeah. And I'm wondering, how does that fit in with protest? I love this idea because, and that's a great example of it, right, just that people came mm. because it was community building. Um, or because they were lonely. Well, I don't know if they'd all be lonely, but maybe some of them were, who can say? But I think it's a yearning for community that we have that is yeah. driving part of this rising of protest culture. Um, there's a stat that I mentioned in the book that according to the Australian Red Cross, one in four Australians is either always lonely or sometimes lonely. And we live in such a lucky country. And you would imagine that, I don't know, I find that really shocking that quarter of us feel that we're missing company. Um, that's partly down to urbanization. We don't know our neighbors as well as we might. We're more transient, we move more often. But I think in this context, the possibility of getting together to share experiences in solidarity around a cause that moves us collectively is a powerful yeah. and attractive idea, right? Uh, yes, and that whole idea of a sense of community, building different communities. Let's talk about that, though, in terms of uh, making communities. W what works best? Is social media the new political march, or is the political march back as a successful tool? What's the means of protest? I'm not a basher of social media as a vehicle for getting people together. I use it, it's part of our lives, and I think it's fabulous. But, and there are many examples of social media being used as a tool to bring people together. But it can't stop there. If it stops there, then it, it fizzles. It needs, as we say in social media, <laughs> I'm too old to say this, but I'm going to say it, IRL in real life. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it needs us to get together beyond Facebook, beyond Instagram, beyond Twitter, in person. And that's where the march comes in. But I think they're feeding each other. Yeah. So, um, you, you mentioned uh, the, the people related to fashion and you mentioned the, the straws. Um, what about people, the people that you report on, how mainly do they become activists? I think it's coming back to that personal thing. When something feels personal, when you see your local beach being ruined by plastic pollution or when you imagine or when you look at the drought in Australia and you hear our politicians say, well, that's got nothing to do with climate change. Those things feel personal. And yes. I think it motivates us to step up and say, this isn't how we see our future. And together we need to make some noise. It's quite about making noise. It is. But some of us will be motivated to do something. Some of us won't. will think, oh, that's bad and won't. Is there a difference in all the people you've reported on in, in the person, in what makes them to go that next step and do something about it? I'd like to say that there was a type, but I honestly don't think that there is a type. I'm going to use the example of Libby Chamberlain, who is the American, and I'm going to do inverted commas, 
ordinary mum from Maine who was uh, worked part-time as a school administrator and had two kids and was supposedly an ordinary mum in her early 30s. I think it's hard to kind of cast the cliche against ordinary. But, yeah, she wasn't... She didn't have access to the corridors of power. She had no previous experience of being a campaign leader, and yet she ignited something extraordinary with the Facebook group Pantsuit Nation, which she just set up out of frustration looking at Trump and feeling that he didn't reflect the values that she wanted to see her country run by. And Pantsuit Nation was born. She also did it because she didn't feel like a person who would be comfortable wearing a slogan T-shirt, which I would, but she didn't feel that was for her. So she bought a pantsuit, which was, of course, Hillary Clinton's preferred uniform, in order to go and cast her vote. And Pantsuit Nation took off exponentially. There were three million members of this private Facebook group within, Months. I think, three weeks or something. Yeah, yeah within a month or, a month. or something. And so, so, but this was an ordinary person who was had a fire in her belly to say, I don't like how this debate is taking shape and well, I'm going to well do something about it. So I don't think that you have to be a certain kind of person. And I think part of the reason I wrote the book was to say we can all be activists. <laughs> we can all find a different way. Not all of us want to do a stump speech, but we can all find a way to... to to express what we feel is the right way to go forward. Yes, yeah, so it comes back to what you say, the personal. It might be a, a, a lack of privilege in our upbringing or... It's a, a sighting of injustice. It's a sighting of injustice. It's a feeling that, that... It's a strong sense of feeling that an injustice is occurring. So what happened in the case of Libby Chamberlain, the 33-year-old mum from Maine? She, she got 3 million Facebook followers. Well, Trump got in, so you, they, many people would... And there were many stories written about how this was a failure. But it's not a failure because it's still happening. And now she's got 3.7 million members. And they're working towards trying to create a more fair, more feminist future in their world. And let's see what happens when in the midterms. But to me, that's not a failure. That's an ongoing yeah. thing. And um, it's easy for us to say that was, a, that was a success and that wasn't. And I think in the media we like to say that wasn't. But to me, I think it was a success because all those people are still are still active and um, still sharing their stories. F Pantsuit Nation is around sharing personal stories, and I think that was also one of the successes of it. It's it, it was an attempt to not just be peddling opinions, but to say this was my experience of misogyny or of feeling that my opinion was crowded out by the current climate. Yeah, and notwithstanding what you said about social media, social media there is a game changer, isn't it? Absolutely. To be able to get three million followers in a matter of weeks. Absolutely. But you mentioned as well what can... Or you asked me, is there a sort of type of activist? I also spend quite a lot of pages in this book uh, telling stories of introvert activists, which I love. And actually, Libby Chamberlain, I read a thing in the Financial Times that she'd given an interview and she used that word, that phrase, introvert activist. But in my book, I tell the stories of craftivists. <laughs> Has anyone heard of the craftivist movement? Kind of like an unusual sure word. Hurts. Like, not very many. Yeah, Great. Only, a, only a handful. Explain this, because the role of crafts in activism is, has become huge. Right. I do an interview with Anne Summers in the book where she says, we were always doing that. The women's movement was all about embroidered, not all about, but was aided with us painting and embroidering banners and making signs, etc. But the concept of a movement called craftivism was new to me. And it was actually invented, if you like, if you want to attribute it to one woman, by a woman called Betsy Greer, who is an American, who just put those two words, craft and activism, together because she liked the idea of stitching her rebellion and is not a person who particularly wants to hold a banner saying climate action now. But there's, and the types of crafts from hiding messages in... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, just explain some of the types of crafts that have been used. This is a good one, and it's also um, aligned to my world, I found out through Fashion Revolution. There's a woman in, in, London, oh, in Britain, she's from Liverpool. Her name is Sarah Corbett, and she started a group called the Craftivist Collective, and she runs something called the School of Gentle Activism. I think it's delightful. And her, she, she definitely comes at it from introvertism, is that a word? From being an introvert? We'll accept it. All right. And she said that 
she'd been a traditional activist. Her parents were like social activists who used to go and try to make change in their local housing community. And they were like full protesters. But she always did it reluctantly, thinking, I don't like this energy. And really, it takes a lot out of me to be chanting and shouting and talking. And so her idea was, how can we, how can we channel our activism quietly? She says this lovely line, which is, if we want our world to be a more fair and beautiful and just place, why shouldn't we make our activism more fair and beautiful and gentle and gorgeous? I'm paraphrasing. What she did, one of the things she does, is she suggests that, and we do it in the book, um, to protest against garment worker injustice and the way that we so often don't pay our garment workers living wages and that they experience dreadful work conditions, not just Rana Plaza, but you know, all the rest of it, long hours, low pay. Um, she wants us to, <laughs> instead of shoplift, shop drop. You can buy a kit online, it costs seven pounds, I bought one, and then you get it, and it's a bunch of paper scrolls and ribbons and some inspirational sentences that you might want to write or you could write your own. And she suggests you get together quietly. We did it noisily, I'm not very quiet. And then you think this stuff through, raise your issues that you would like to bring towards the unjust, cruel fashion industry exploiting workers, and write a little note. Do you know who made this cheap coat? <laughs> Was the worker paid fairly? Please consider it. And then you roll it up, tie it up with a ribbon, and then you go into, I'll just say the words she tells you to, go to Zara, or any of your insert name of cheap fast fashion establishment here, and then surreptitiously pop said scroll into the pocket of a coat, or run off. I'm and not necessarily <laughs> encouraging you do this on the way home. Well, presumably you can't get arrested because you didn't nick anything, right? Who knows? I didn't get arrested. How many times have you done that? Oh, only once. We just did it for this. But um, people so did do it, and actually, who knows what the outcomes were, but there yeah. is a serious context to this. I mean, it's kind of delightful and amusing. What would you think if you put your hand in your pocket and you read this thing? Would it make you wonder about injustice? I think it would. Her idea is that you do it in a gentle way. It might be a surprise, but not with an aggressive line or... I don't know. But I like the idea that by doing something almost playful and certainly yeah. surprising, you could raise serious political issues, maybe in the minds of people who hadn't considered them. Yeah, and innovative, an innovative way Creative. of doing it. Yeah, do you, you spoke about her with such a, uh, a smile then. Do you have, I know you also have a soft spot for Rosa Parks. Who's your favourite change maker that you've written about or campaigner? The reason that I love the story of Rosa Parks, which I had been very familiar with it from university but hadn't really remembered properly until I researched it again for this book or hadn't known the details is that when Rosa Parks catalyzed the, the Montgomery bus boycott which lasted for a whole year she did so not entirely by accident because the context which I, I'm sure you're probably quite familiar with but her husband was active in the civil rights movement she had been a victim of injustice on public transport before at the hands of the particular bus driver in this yeah. case. So it didn't come out of nowhere. But actually, Rosa Parks was a, another, inverted commas, ordinary woman. She was a middle-aged woman. Uh, I think if you wanted to put her in a cliched box, you'd say a well-behaved woman. She wasn't a career activist. She was coming home from work where she'd been working in a department store as a seamstress. And it was just that moment, a moment that she took... She was, for those of you who aren't aware, I'm sure you are, but she was asked to move from the middle section of the bus to move into the black section, the designated black section, to make way for a white man to sit down. And four people were asked to move, and three of them moved, but Rosa refused to move. And that quiet act of defiance, yeah. dignified act of defiance, sparked a revolution. I mean, incredible. Do you think she's got the kudos she deserves in history? Well, I think... I. Th I mean, I think it's a very famous story, but I think if you were to ask people who didn't know all about the civil rights movement, if you were to ask young people who hadn't yeah. been taught it, maybe they would know more about Martin Luther King because he's the one standing up there with the incredible speeches, and my goodness, he's amazing. But I love also the stories of the more quiet... Yeah. Um, ..the more quiet actions. And also, I think it's really important for us to remember that, as you mentioned, Gloria Steinem, a movement is only people moving, but it takes many, many people, you, you see the leader, but it's not just the leader, it's all the people behind them. So from feminism to tiny houses, climate change to consumerism, I'm wondering, is it the issue that attracts the attention, the campaign means, 
or is it getting the right leader? People, I think it's human nature to love to look at, to, to someone. You lead someone as a kind of beacon, don't you? Um, so I think that's why we often remember the stories of the leaders. But to me, it's the moment, it's the context that makes the movement sing, right? It's all the people getting together, but it's the context. So timing's important. Timing's absolutely everything, isn't it? Yeah, so you mention um, Bob Brown in the book. You say you make the point that the campaign to protect the Franklin in southwest Tasmania really made his name as a, as a leader. He was a wonderful leader and continues to be a wonderful leader. And just explain how he got involved. Well, I mean, the story of the Franklin Dam, I didn't even know this because I'm from Britain. I mean, I, I, I didn't grow up with it. But it was the spark of, of the green movement in Australia, the modern green movement in Australia. And I think that the power of that campaign was actually, I find it interesting. It was to do with, I think people got behind that campaign because of the the idea of desecrating beauty. There was an amazing photograph that ran in all the Fairfax newspapers of the river bend. Oh, yes. And that picture, and it was, I found this fab. So it was, it was around the first time that ads and newspapers would be colour. And to see this, m the majesty of nature in colour in the papers, if you didn't have it in your backyard, you couldn't ignore it. The idea that for money we would desecrate nature of such majesty mobilised people in their lounge rooms. You and know, he was able to do that, wasn't he? Well, him and his team, but I and think that he, he is, to me, I, I look up to him greatly because I think he's such a voice of reason in environmentalism, which we don't have enough of now. But a lot of this book was actually about saying, bow down to Bob, I do. But I want to also hear stories from young women. And I feel that particularly in climate, which is something I'm very active in, we don't often hear from young women talking about these issues. And this space has been taken up by male voices. And that's fine, but I'd like to see, I'm not saying we shouldn't hear from them. Bill McKibben is another of my great idols. But I also want to hear from women in the space, and particularly young women. We've all got a stake in this stuff. And yeah. so I tell some, I tell, I dedicate lots of space, more than to Bob, to two, um, two young women who are students at University of New South Wales who were active in fossil free, in the fossil free union movement, and just tell the story of why they, aged 20 and 21, decided that they need to f take action to try to get their university to divest from investing in fossil fuels. And it worked, and it's fab. And I think those stories are just as important. Well, absolutely. And you actually make the point about young people in the book that 14 is nominated as the best age to get involved in activism. Now, that surprised me, having a 13 and a 14-year-old. <laughs> Do Did, you agree? Um, I, I think in my house, um, young women talk about fashion and where it comes from all the time. Not necessarily the bigger picture, perhaps, but I'm wondering, do you think a 14-year-old speaks from the heart and that's the value, but do they have the ability to strategize and plan so the movement stays alive? We saw the, a big group of Americans get together in the wake of Donald oh, Trump and guns, for our lives. and it was just terrific, but it stopped. And I wonder if, if you need that heart, but you also need the head to plan it long term. Well, they're still at it. It hasn't stopped. I mean, that birthed a whole new generation of activists. Anyone who, I'm sure everyone was glued to the screen watching Emma Gonzalez make those speeches on the March for Our Lives rally um, about trying to, to curb gun violence in the US. I mean, Emma was 18 years old. Yeah. I can never get out of my mind that her eyes, her incredible passion, speaking about what it was like to watch her, her fellow students, her friends, be gunned down at Parkland. I don't think that that has just stopped. I mean, obviously, they're not going to just completely change gun culture in the States overnight. Movements take time. And uh, I mean, there's another story in the book about Me Too, and the founder of that movement was actually 10 years ago, Tarana Burke, who was working with marginalized people of color in Alabama. And that's where Me Too started. It was about trying to encourage women to talk, young women to talk about their experiences. But she says, what's the difference between a moment and a movement? Movements take a long time. Yes. So um, I can't help thinking you have such a lovely sense of optimism. Uh -huh. Are you optimistic yeah. we are going to change things? We need to hear from Victor. Was anyone here yesterday hearing from Victor talk about yes, optimism? Yes, Victor's in the audience. Um, I think I agree with Victor that optimism is such a powerful thing in the face of this stuff. 
if you want to take people with you on a journey, you're not going to do it by being negative and telling everyone how gloomy life is. In my work, I work hard to try to present some solutions. I don't have all the solutions to big issues, of course, but when it comes to fashion where I work, I try really hard to be saying, this is some bad stuff. Fashion is implicated in modern slavery, one of the top five industries in which is implicated. That's not good, but I'm not going to leave you there. I want to then say, what can we do creatively together? And how can we do it with a positive spirit to bring other people along? Very briefly, so many young people in this audience, what is the message you want to leave them with? Oh, get out and do stuff. Um, and get off your phones. No, <laughs> no start on your phones. Come I on. I think that's stop. a great way, way to end our conversation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Claire Prince. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.